Thank you. I'm delighted to be here uh, with you. So, uh, at the first TED talk I did, I had a throwaway line that computer science was the worst thing to happen to computers or to science. <laughs> Um, and more recently, I did a talk for CERN where they asked me to explain what I meant. And there's maybe a corollary, which is physical science is the worst thing to happen to computing. So what I'd like to do is spend about the next 45 minutes talking about what I meant. Uh, my colleague Seth Lloyd wrote this wonderful paper where he calculated the universe can do 10 to the 120 ops on 10 to the 90 bits of data. That, that's the computational capacity of the universe. Given those resources, to a computer scientist, this is what you do. You write a program. It gets compiled into an object code. That gets compiled into an executable. And that gets sent to a processor that processes that and computes. And if you're a computer scientist, there's this very finely refined taxonomy of models of computation. Each of these is a different computational model. So that's, that's the canon of computer science. But it's kind of strange. Why do you change representation about five different times from the program down to the physics? Um, if you go from the building I work in to the street, to the city, to the state, to the country, it's, there's a hierarchy, but you don't change the geometry of the map at each of those scales. And to a physicist, sort of all of that compute, computational complexity is kind of silly. There's only one model of computation in our universe, which is a patch of space, occupies space, it takes time to transit, it can represent a state, and the states can interact. That, that's what the universe does. There, that really is the only model of computation. The rest is a fiction on top of that. And so we've ended up, if you've seen the movie Metropolis, it's sort of like computing frolics around in the garden and physics down in the basement moves the levers <laughs> to, to make it all work. And that's, that's kind of, that's current practice today. So I started this program, the Center for Bits and Atoms, because I fundamentally could never tell the difference between computer science and physical science. I didn't understand that boundary. And so this was a program to work right at the boundary of digital and physical, where you didn't have to figure out what was on what side. And to give you a feeling, um, these are some of the students from the program. Uh, one of my students, Jason Taylor, uh, is in charge of all the computing at Facebook, the billions of dollars of data centers. Um, and it's strange, another one of my students, Rafi, um, was in charge of all of the computing at Twitter, the billions of dollars of data center, until Uber hired him. And it's really strange that, you know, a I don't run a large program, could run so many of the things in Silicon Valley, but the connection is, on the scale of Facebook, you can't pretend hardware and software are different. You have to think very deeply about how Watts dollars and pounds map into information. You can't abstract it away as this is software and that's hardware. You really have to understand how all those resources come together in this much deeper way. So Rafi, who ran Twitter's computing, uh, this is um, something I wrote with him and one of the internet architects that was the first thing on the idea of an internet of things, just to give you a feeling for the work they did. Jason, who, who, runs, who still runs uh, Facebook's computing infrastructure, was part of a project where we did the first non-trivial quantum computations. This was the first implementation of Grover's algorithm to search in root end time uh, implemented with nuclear spin resonance in the very early days of quantum computing. Since then, these um, uh, um, nuclear magnetic resonance techniques uh, don't scale, but the, um, what scales is the techniques we developed for this for Hamiltonian engineering um, that are used now to make pulse sequences uh, ever since. So Jason was working on that project. Um, another one of the students, um, Ben, uh, his thesis turned into creating a semiconductor company that 
solves digital problems with chips that use analog device degrees of freedom. It's not analog computing, it's digital computing, but by using the analog device degrees of freedom to do digital logic, you can take a shortcut and go into the interior of the hypercube of a digital system and have all kinds of benefits in noise and speed and power. Uh, this was a student, Manu Prakash, uh, uh, this is a science paper where we showed how to do universal logic in microfluidics. So um, this is using, this is a one-bit memory latch, um, using droplet-droplet interactions in Navier-Stokes equation to do digital logic. Um, this is high-speed video slowed down of uh, those junctions are logic gates. Uh, a single bit goes out to the left, two bits, the second one comes out to the right, where one bit can probe the other one. So these are bits that now transport mass as well as information. And so if you think about all of that universe and the richness of quantum degrees of freedom and these physical degrees of freedom, the prevailing programming model dates back to this. And this is a real historical accident. Uh, von Neumann wrote a memo called the first draft of a report on the EDVAC. You've all probably heard of von Neumann's architecture. Von Neumann never wrote about von Neumann's architecture. What he did is he wrote this memo on the EDVAC and the EDVAC was this early computer. It was one of the first stored programs computer. And um, this memo is really just a hack. It's how do you take this pile of stuff, um, let's see, uh, 1945, how do you take that pile of stuff and make it work? The computer you know, in your phone, in your laptop, in your office, is the legacy of programming that stuff. That's what we live with as von Neumann's architecture. Uh, um, uh, see, I didn't know von Neumann, but one of my mentors was Marvin and Minsky, and I could ask Marvin what Johnny thought. And Johnny did a number of profound things, and I'll talk about some of them. And again, this isn't one of them. This was just a historical hack that was never meant. It's, it's way past its due date. Um, and you can trace it back to er an earlier really historical accident, which is this. Alan Turing gave us the modern theory of computing, and the Turing machine was this abstraction that helped explain computational universality. But the Turing machine is profoundly unphysical in the following sense. Um, there's a tape and then there's a head. The head reads and writes the tape and processes it, um, but the head is distinct from the tape. What that means is information on the tape can't interact. It can only interact when the tape comes to the head. Again, in the physicist model of computation, that's very silly because the tape can interact with itself. In the Turing model, the cape tape can't do anything until the head comes over to it. What that means is the computer over here right now is doing many more um, physical operations, shuttling information from memory transistors to processor transistors even though the processor transistors are every, the memory transistors are every bit as powerful as the processor transistors. So most of the work of this is doing doesn't advance anything I want to do. It just shuttles information around from the tape to the head based on this abstraction that processing information is different from storing it, even though physically it's the same physics. So a few years ago, we did a project to ask, what if we just gave up and did a do-over? We had a good few decade run but computer science was fundamentally done wrong. And rather than software ignoring physics, what if software had physical units? So what if software represented space and time? So it looked like zooming the Google map, not Metropolis. So we made, this has a lot of antecedents, but what we made is an, a, um, a synchronous computing model based on propagation of tokens where the distance a token travels is proportional to the amount of information you store, which is proportional to the time to transit, which is proportional to the amount of work you can do on it. So those are all coupled like they are in the physics. And then what we implemented is the BLAS, the Routines in High Performance Computing, in this model where computation is geometry. So now this is a fly-through of the BLAS, now like the zoom of a Google map, where you can fly all the way down to a single device degree of freedom and all the way up to a program, but you don't go through all these contortions of the geometry. It respects physics at every level of description through that stack. And in many ways, we found 
once you make software look like hardware, a lot of what's hard about computing becomes easy. Things like thread synchronization and parallel programming and all of those things that are hard to do in the pretend world are actually really natural in the physical world because that's kind of how the physical world works. So in turn, if you can represent computation, not as lines of code, but as geometry, so software looks like physics, you can in turn um, address a bigger historical omission. So uh, Claude Shannon wrote the best master's thesis ever. I, the date, I think, was 1930, 1940, early 40s. Um, if you haven't read it, I recommend it. It's the best master's thesis ever, beautifully written. Um, uh, when he was at MIT, and in his master's thesis, he invents the modern notion of digital, showing universality of digital logic. And what he went on to do at Bell Labs was prove the first threshold theorem. So digital doesn't really mean one and zero. What digital means is, I could speak to you as a waveform, like I'm doing now, or I could speak to you through a network as a code. If I send my voice to you as a code, what Shannon showed is for a linear increase in the physical resources representing the code, there's an exponential reduction in the error rate to decode it as long as the noise is below a threshold. If the noise is above a threshold, you're doomed. It diverges exponentially. If it's below it, it drops exponentially. Now, there's very few exponentials in engineering, and that's the big one. That exponential scaling is what lets you communicate reliably with an unreliable device. Phone calls got work with di worse with distance. We now have the internet. So then later, uh, at MIT, Vannevar Bush made the last great analog computer, a room full of gears and pulleys, and the computation got worse with time as it diverged. Um, this is one of the things von Neumann did that is profound. What he showed is if you view a computation as a communication, apply Shannon to the computer, you can propagate the message through the computation and compute reliably with an unreliable device. And that's what lets you have a billion transistors in your Pentium, um, but the billionth one is as useful as the first one. And there's a really interesting physical history to that. Um, uh, Maxwell posited Maxwell's demon. Uh, Zillard reduced Maxwell's demon to the single to a case of a single molecule on either side of a partition. Um, that introduced KT log two as the smallest unit of information. And then Shannon um, met and was aware of that lineage um, of Zillard's work in the birth of the bit of information. And in turn, Turing um, got to know Shannon um, uh, through the war effort at the Institute for Advanced Studies. And so there's, there's kind of this parallel history of the physics of computing through that story. So now, at that same time, uh, at, around that same time, in 1952, MIT made the first computer manufacturing machine. This was an offshoot of the Whirlwind, which was the first real-time computer. And jet planes were just starting then, and it was hard to make the parts by hand. And so there was this epiphany that you could take um, the first real-time computer, and instead of processing information, you could have it turn the cranks of a machine to make a part that a two-handed machinist couldn't do. So that was the birth of computer-controlled manufacturing. But in a fundamental way, this doesn't fit. Because the information is in the computer, it's not in the material. And so it's a fundamentally analog manufacturing process. Um, the real digit, once computation becomes geometrical, the real opportunity is to digitize fabrication by putting codes into the construction of materials. And so the model for that is biology. If you mix chemicals, a yield of a part per hundred is good. Um, the ribosome assembling proteins makes an error rate of a part in 10 to the minus four with error checking in the tRNAs. When you replicate DNA, there's an extra error correcting step, and the error rate is a part in 10 to the 8. And that's what makes it possible to make you by having codes in your construction that let you detect and correct errors. So not squirting or cutting, but coding construction. So a few years ago, I ran a meeting with the White House and a whole bunch of agencies, because they all wanted to come talk about 3D printing. 
And I was yelling at them, 3D printing is kind of doubly a distraction. <laughs> it's just one of many different ways computers today can move end effectors to make stuff. And if you run a lab like mine, you use a 3D printer some of the time, but we have all kinds of other interesting ways computers move tools around to make stuff in the short term. But in the long term, it misses this much deeper point about phone calls before and after Shannon, computers before and after von Neumann, and now manufacturing going from analog to digital, not just in the design, but actually in the materials. And so to get there, we're progressing from computers controlling machines to machines making machines, then putting codes and materials, then programs and materials. And I'll tell you a little bit about each of those. So one step in is just machines. So um, these are some of the companies my students have spun off uh, making rapid prototyping machines that you can buy and make stuff. But those aren't really the final goal. Those are just warm-ups to the step after that, which is rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping machines, making the machines as easy to make as projects. So this was an example one of my students did with an educational program I'll talk about in a little bit, where... Um, she's doing is these are modular machine building components that you can make with rapid prototyping machines. Um, so she's taking trifold science fair cardboard, um, cutting out uh, interesting shapes. Then we have custom motors with integrated lead screws and any backlash nuts uh, made for us in Shenzhen. Then you assemble these degrees of freedom, and there's no static machine, there's just degrees of freedom, and then those get connected in real-time networks. So you first build the degrees of freedom, in this case these are linear ones, and then we sent these kits of parts out to students all over the world, and the um, beginners each had a week to make a machine. So here's a Korean calligraphy machine. A, this is in Mexico, a, a 3D scanner. Hot Icelandic coffee stirrer. A um, Chinese light show, but this is now a, a multi-axis hot wire cutter. Um, and so each of these, you learn about machine building, but much more than that, rather than using a rapid prototyping machine, you do rapid prototyping of the rapid prototyping machine. So the machine is as flexible as a project you do with the machine. Here's a, a lathe. So that's interesting. But what comes, those are still cutting or depositing. What comes after that is what we've come to call digital materials. So think of amino acids or Lego bricks. When a child plays with Lego, the tower is more accurate than the motor control of the child because the bricks are detecting and correcting errors. You don't need a rule to play, ruler to place Lego because the geometry comes from the parts, not the child. You can join Lego bricks made out of dissimilar material. And when you're done, you don't put Lego in the trash. You take it apart and use it again. None of that applies to essentially any advanced manufacturing, but all of that applies to what Shannon and von Neumann taught us. Those are properties of coding construction. So we've been looking at how you digitize materials, and we're doing that on nanoscales with molecular assemblers, on microscales with microassemblers, on bigger scales we showed we can set the world record for highest performance ultralight materials, not by having a tool the size of a jumbo jet to make a jumbo jet, by making little loops of carbon fiber and linking them and then making robot insects that crawl around to build jumbo jets and space uh, structures. And so I'll take you through uh, one part of that space. Um, this is scaling Lego down to nano Lego. So the scale bar on the upper right is 351 nanometers. So this is making you know, nanometer scale Lego bricks that you assemble just like you assemble Lego, but now on, on nano scales. Um, and then here's a neat machine. Uh, this is one size bigger. This is a micro assembler for building uh, electronics. And so this is like the child playing with Lego. It has a feedstock of the micro Lego bricks that it places into three-dimensional structures. And the idea is with just conducting and insulating bricks, you can make PCBs, capacitors, inductors, interconnect. With one resistive brick, you can make any resistor value. Digikey stocks 500,000 resistor types. I can make them with three parts. 
And then you can add semiconducting bricks for logic. Um, th this is a design workflow for this. And then in turn, once you can start adding actuator bricks, so adding things like piezoelectric bricks and magnetic bricks. And so this is a design tool that lets you model um, uh, gravity forces deformation of these micro parts. And so here you can start placing them to do things like make a motion platform. And so now this is building the modular components like I showed you for, but not by sourcing motors in Shenzhen, but actually by composing these discrete parts. And then from there, you can start to make things like walkers. And then from there, you can start to design robots that are composed out of these, these building brick parts. And so it's sort of like Minecraft, but Minecraft with real physics. And what we're up to here is this is a first version of a design of an assembler that assembles assemblers out of the parts that it's assembling. And it, and it turns out that recursion is essential because ribosomes can make an elephant, but ribosomes are slow. They add about one amino acid a second. Uh, but because ribosomes make ribosomes, you have exponentially many, tens of millions in a cell. And the reason biology does that is if you try to place more than one part at a time, it scales terribly because you become exponentially sensitive to relative misalignment of the parts you're placing. Instead, you scale by doing serial assembly but having massively parallel serial assemblers. And so that's why it's essential to scale to make an assembler that places one part at a time but design the assembler so the assembler can make itself out of the parts that it's assembling. And the way we're designing it um, on the left goes from these discrete material parts to building them into functional units like an actuator, to building those into modules like a walker, to building those into systems like the assembler. And that should look familiar. In biology, you're made out of primary structure, which is the sequence of amino acids that codes for the backbone of a protein. That then folds into secondary structure, which are things like alpha helices and beta sheets, the basic geometry. Those then fold into tertiary structure um, that are functional units, like light sensors in your eye or molecular sensors in your nose. And then those are assembled into the quaternary structure, which is then like the, the systems in your eye that detect light or the you know, motors that move your muscles. And what we've sort of backed into is not copying biology. It's kind of forward engineering biology rather than reverse engineering it, but building primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure to go from a small set of building blocks up to this complexity of embodied computation in assemblers assembling assemblers. And in turn, that should look familiar, or may look familiar. I complained about von Neumann, but his architecture wasn't something he thought was important. Um, this is what he thought was important. The last thing he did in life was study self-reproducing systems. He co-invented cellular automata, a world where time, space, and state are all discrete, like the game of life. And he did it to rep because you couldn't do it experimentally to design a system that can reproduce itself as the core model to understand life. And to do that, he needed to rep write a computer program that can copy itself into a new machine, which means he had to represent computation as geometry. So the very last thing he did in life was exactly sort of where I picked up and what I was describing, representing computation as geometry for fabrication. Now that was purely theoretical. What's exciting is we're really at a point now where we can start to think about making self-reproducing machines with assembling assemblers. So in turn, that has really surprising implications. Uh, Mainframe computers became hobbyist computers, became mini computers, became hobbyist computers, became personal computers. We're retracing that history going from mainframes of fabrication to mini computers of fabrication to hobbyist computers of fabrication to, to the Star Trek replicator. So the 3D printer isn't the replicator. It makes a little piece of plastic. Um, it can't make anything. I just described the research roadmap up to the replicator. But what's important about this picture is the internet wasn't invented after the PC, it was invented decades before. 
And that's exactly the moment we're at right now. So I appreciated that when NSF funded the launch of CBA, which was a proposal where I asked for one of every machine to make anything. That was roughly the proposal. And then I had this problem, I had all these machines. I had to teach people how to use them. And so I started a class modestly called How to Make Almost Anything, which was just how to use all these machines. And what I wasn't prepared for, for a class aimed at a few research students, you know, every year hundreds of students show up begging to get in to take the class. And they do the most amazing things. They learn to use all these tools, and then they do projects to integrate them. The star of the first year was Kelly. This is what she did. Hi, I'm Kelly, and this is my screen line. Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you really have to scream, but you can't because you're at work, or you're in a classroom, or you're watching your children, or you're in any number of situations where it's just not well, ScreenBody is a portable space for screaming. When a user screams into ScreenBody, their scream is silenced. But it is also recorded for later release, where, when, and how the user chooses. So, um, MIT made the first transistorized computers, the TX series, that came from the whirlwind. Those were commercialized as DEC PDPs. PDPs were used to create the internet. DEC is bankrupt. And the head of DEC famously said, nobody needs a computer in the home. DEC didn't survive. Computing became personal. What these students are really showing, um, uh, th uh, this is a web browser for parrots. This is an alarm clock you wrestle with. This is a dress that defends personal space. Um, what these <laughs> students are showing is that the killer app of digital fabrication is personal fabrication. And so in turn, what that led to was, in the research I described, we use arrays of million dollar machines. Those are supported by a workshop with $100,000 machines to make the research parts. But within that, for things like the how to make class, there's $10,000 machines we use. And so um, NSF approached us about doing outreach about all of this. And we made a deal with them. Rather than talking about what we're doing, we thought the tools were more interesting. So we put together community fab labs. So this is what a fab lab looks like today. It's about a $100,000 investment. It's about two tons. You know, for $1,000, you can make a little machine. $10,000, you can make a really nice machine. This is an ensemble of, say, 10 of the $10,000 machines. Think of it as sort of the town library scale of technology. So it's a 3D scanning and printing, small scale precision machining, um, laser cutting, large format machining, um, surface mount rework embedded programming, so sort of technology to create technology. And so with that room, um, you can make all of this, boats, bicycles, furniture, consumer electronics, production tooling, short run. All of this isn't made in a factory or MIT. This is made in one of the, these community labs. Um, and then an accident happened. Uh, these have been doubling for a decade. The doubling time is a year and a half, and there's about 1,000 now. Uh, our idea was we would set up one as an outreach project and go back to work, and they've been doubling ever since. <laughs> Um, and so this is a really interesting one of these fab labs in the network working with at-risk youth in Detroit. Uh, this is one work, um, with the Cook Inlet Tribal Council working with Native Alaskans. Uh, this is one at the Protestant Catholic Boundary in Northern Ireland, right at what people call the Peace Wall, um, euphemistically. Um, this is one at the um, uh, Israeli-Palestinian boundary um, in Israel. So transcending all of these boundaries with the tools to create. And so in turn, we had a problem. Um, this was a, a, a Hans Christian who lives hours above the Arctic Circle. And we introduced him to the lab. And then this is a robot truck he designed. Uh, this is Chapiso in essentially a shanty town 
outside Pretoria in South Africa who was doing the work of my MIT classes. We had these people going just way ahead of local educational opportunity. And the usual answer is to tell them, you're smart, you have to leave now. You have to go away somewhere far away. And so around then, uh, Seymour Papert uh, came to me with a really interesting observation. I didn't early on know his history, but of course, Seymour worked with Piaget, came to MIT to get access to the early PDPs so that kids could, so with Piaget, um, kids are scientists and they learn by experimenting and we slowly train that out of them. Seymour wanted to give them access to computers to expand the ability to experiment. That then led to Alan Kay with Windows and Mice and then Mitch Resnick with Lego Logo Mindstorms. Um, but the very first version was a turtle, where the kid would program the turtle with a PDP. And Seymour told me it was a, he made this gesture where it was a thorn in his side that the kid could tell the turtle how to move, but what he really wanted was the kid to create the turtle. Not to move the turtle, but to create the turtle. And viewed that way, these fab labs that for me were just an accident from an outreach on this research of digitizing fabrication kind of exactly line up in his roadmap as kind of the next point in that series. And so that led us to start a program called the Fab Academy, which is teaching how to do all of these skills, but now globally. And so the way um, that works is students have peers in work groups with mentors locally in these labs with machines. Then we connect them globally with video and content sharing in a giant global network of local labs. And, so, and then again, they do projects. So this is one now, not at MIT, not in a formal institution, but in a little tiny lab in a forest outside Barcelona. And this was one student's project for the class. He wanted to do aquaponics. And so you know, on day one, this is his skills. Here's his sketch. Then he's starting to learn CAD tools, and so here's a better design. Then he's doing rapid prototyping to make a little model. Then he's doing large format machining to make a big model. Then he's doing the liquid handling. Then um, he's learned PCB design, and so he's designing the controller for the um, lights and the liquid and the temperature. And around week 16, he's eating food grown in the aquaponics system. Um, and he's been through a couple generations of producing food with his project, and now here's the whole system where you know, it's additive and subtractive and 2D and 3D and form function all coming together in his homework assignment to make this aquaponic system. So again, that's not a formal institution. It's a little community fab lab locally, but connected globally. And so in computing terms, you can think of MIT as a mainframe. You go there and get processed. It works well. Um, somebody last year calculated the economic output of businesses from MIT falls between the economic output of Russia and India. It's, it's the world's ninth economy. So it, it works well, but it's only a few thousand people. Um, online classes are exactly like the time-sharing era in computing, like BitNet. You're a terminal connected to this mainframe. The way the Fab Academy is working is exactly like the internet. The internet beat BitNet because what it does is determined by what you connect to the network, not the construction of the network, and you grow at the edges. And so um, MOOCs, you change at the center. The, the Fab Academy is working as an educational network. It's not do it yourself. Um, it's curated, mentored, but it's distributed in just the way the internet is um, distributed. Um, it's growing. George Church, my colleague at Harvard, is now teaching a second class using this network to use a fab lab to make a bio lab and then teach biotechnology. So this is how to grow almost anything. And um, uh, this is a program I did with Michael Crow, the very interesting president of Arizona State University, on the question of are, are universities obsolete? And my answer would be 50%. Not 50% of universities um, where some are zero and some are 100%, but but half of each university is obsolete in the sense that 
At the same time I created 1,000 fab labs at MIT, I helped create a building that took 10 years to plan and $100 million and fits a few hundred people. And so then you have to ask, are what those people doing worth that, worth that cost structure? Or can you do it in this much more scalable, distributed way? And I'd say about half of what's done at MIT really justifies that cost structure. The machines are so expensive or the people are so scarce that it really makes sense. But about half of it doesn't justify that cost structure. And the point is not do it yourself, but the point is networks to do it in this much more distributed way. And so um, the lab in Barcelona, um, if you look at e once a year all these labs meet, uh, a couple years ago we did it in Barcelona, each of those flags you see is a new lab being set up in Barcelona. And the background to that is, uh, this is, uh, the, the, at the time, the mayor of Barcelona. They have great design sense and 50% youth unemployment. A whole generation can't leave home and work. So rather than trying to get jobs to get money so you can then buy things that come in on containers and ships in the harbor and then send trash out and trash trucks to the dump, what they're doing is they're filling the city with tools for digital fabrication, not primarily as a business, but as infrastructure. In the same way the city provides clean water and electricity, it's now providing the means to fabricate as part of the infrastructure of the city. And what the mayor is doing is starting a 40-year countdown to urban self-sufficiency, to the idea that it's not protectionism. The bits come and go freely. It's globally connected for knowledge, but the atoms stay energy, food, consumer electronics, all that sort of stuff is sustainably produced locally in the city. Um, things like that led to this. This is a mobile fab lab, and this was an event where we set it up literally outside the Oval Office. It, you know, if you have a White House badge, you're not allowed to be outside the window of the Oval Office, but we brought in big lasers and large format tools, and so um, you know, White House security was going crazy. Obama loved it, though. The surface story was, was celebrating maker stuff, but the subtext is much more profound. You know, the maker movement is full of really bad engineering and lacks mentoring for how to go from easy to hard. And what's really going on here is in the same way PCs killed off mini computers, this isn't just play, it's not just outreach. The new jobs aren't coming back to the old factories, it's really creating new, new ways to work. Um, so things like that then led um, Bill Foster to write this very interesting bill. I'm United States Congressman Bill Foster, and I'm one of the few members of the United States House of Representatives who was a scientist before entering politics. So I often tell people that I represent about one-third of the strategic reserve of physicists in Congress. <laughs> but when I came into work each day in physics, my first stop often wasn't to my office computer or some meeting but to the laboratory machine shop to check on the progress of some parts that I designed for an experiment or for part of an accelerator. So I can think that, I believe I can safely say that I'm the only member of the United States Congress that knows how to program numerically controlled machine tools. I'm proud to announce that I recently introduced legislation in the United States House of Representatives which supports the goals and mission of the National Fab Lab Network as in the best interest of our people and the best interest of promoting the goals of greater science and technical education, greater access to research and production tools, and empowerment of individuals to understand and use technology to improve their lives. You can think of the NFLN as a new kind of national lab in the United States that's a cloud laboratory, a national network of connected local labs. I've been lucky to have the chance to visit Neil and see the progenitor. So um, this is written not as an appropriation, but chartering it as in the national interest as a public-private partnership. And there have been some initial commitments, like Chevron made a $10 million commitment to set up these labs as a vehicle where funding can come in to support these locally. Uh, if you're interested, he's collecting co-sponsors for the bill to try to take money in a lot of different areas and use this as a way to create a national network of these local labs as part of our national uh, infrastructure. I mean, um, I just... Uh, and in turn, that's led to things like this. The, um, UN uh, 
late last year, I was at the UN General Assembly where the Sustainable Development Goals were launched. This was the biggest gathering of heads of state ever with this roadmap for the planet for the next 15 years. And the White House wanted to show not just goals, but how to meet them. So we set up a pop-up lab in the UN. I brought a colleague from Peru who grew up in the jungle, where as he describes it, the career choices were farmer, soldier, or terrorist. You got to pick one of those three. And he's become a leader in this digital fabrication community in Latin America. And he's sending rapid prototyping tools up the Amazon for sustainable development with indigenous communities. And if you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, it's things like nutrition, water quality, education, all of those things, they end up resting on the ability to turn data into things and things into data, taking digital communication and computation and connecting it to fabrication. And so there are these interesting moments where the diplomats would like, look at us funny and say, why are you here? Um, but then would get, th this is, they usually don't talk to people like us, but this is how you meet these sustainable development goals. And most recently, we did a collaboration with the International Committee of the Red Cross and the UN High Commissioner on Refugees to use this whole lab network for um, humanitarian disaster response uh, coming out of that. And so that finally leads, this is a fun thing I did a few months ago that's, on, uh, that's bonus material in the home edition of the movie The Martian, where with the White House, DARPA, NASA, and uh, Bill Nye, we were on the set of uh, um, 20th Century Fox with the cast and crew of The Martian looking at how you actually do go to Mars. And what I was talking about was NASA's approach to going to Mars historically is roughly redoing the whole industrial revolution. So you want to end up with the 500,000 resistors from DigiKey. And what I'm explaining is the analog with amino acids, you're made from 20 parts composed in this hierarchical complexity. And by doing amino acids for engineering, with you know, order 20 parts, you can create a technological civilization. And so that's what they described as going to Mars without luggage. And so it really leads to the sort of fundamental notion of what are the fundamental building blocks to create a civilization by mastering this idea of sort of programming reality by digitizing fabrication. So stepping back, there's follow-up in these things. If you look at the tour I just did, is it physical, is it physics? Is it computer science? You know, is it mechanical engineering? The whole point of CBA as a program is it's just the wrong question. That boundary doesn't make sense. You know, the question is how you turn data into things and things into data, and it doesn't fit the basis set of physical science versus computer science versus you know, mechanical engineering. But in turn, you know, MIT is built on scarcity. You assume books are scarce, tools are scarce, space is scarce, people are scarce. If anybody can make anything anywhere, and, and you connect digital communication so we can talk at a distance, with digital computing so we can share information, with digital fabrication, you can essentially bring the campus to the student, not the student to the campus. Not in isolation by yourself. We found it's essential to have communities, but you can create these local communities um, and then connect them globally. And in turn, in those places, you can learn, you can create businesses, you can play, you can make art. And so is it a school? Is it a business? Is it a social program? Again, that's the wrong question. If, if anybody can make anything anywhere, it fundamentally challenges how we live, learn, work, and play. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions.